Okay, everyone, welcome back to Telos Bound. Uh, welcome to Theoretical Warfare. <laughs> I'm here with uh, Todd McGowan, who's here to respond to some of Zizek's critiques of his philosophy uh, made all the way back in 2019. Feels, uh, feels like a long time ago. Uh, so Todd truly needs no introduction. Uh, all I will say is welcome back to the channel, and uh, I hope your uh, responses to Zizek are extra vicious today. Well, I don't think they will be, but thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I need those. I need those short clips to to, to take, and then they go viral. <laughs> yeah, something something different than uh, Slavoj's interaction with Terry Pinkard, which is yes, very, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do have a question about that actually related okay. to that. But yeah. so, so the first question, it's probably uh, it's the most general question, maybe the most difficult to answer. Um, what do you mean by contradiction? Because for you, Hegel, the essence of Hegel really is contradiction. And does G do you know if Zizek agrees with you on the meaning of contradiction? And also, I'll just add that I was reading the section on force uh, in the phenomenology of spirit, and Hegel pretty much explicitly says that the con contradiction is the negation of negation when you find that the antithesis contains an antithesis in itself. So how would you define contradiction? Yeah, that's pretty good. So Hegel also discusses in the doctrine of essence in the science of logic. That's the other place if you want to see where he's explicitly talking about contradiction. It's interesting that those are two of the hardest parts in his philosophy, like the force understanding section is really yeah. I think without question, the hardest part of the phenomenology. Uh, yeah, I think I think Slavoj has the same position. I think most people that think about Hegel in the same way that we do uh, have the same position. And I think you're right to link it to negativity. So it's the point at which uh, an identity undermines itself and then becomes what it isn't. So that 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 so contradiction is the way in which a thing is both itself and what it isn't and so or what itself and what it what it what it's identical to itself and and identical with what's different from it so that for me and that is also self negation so i think that those two terms can in some way be uh swapped out in hegel negation and contradiction that you could focus either way like dieter henrich has his his reading of hegel focuses almost solely on negativity and negation and it's not that far removed from mine so i think that that's i think that those really that that those that's those points that just are just two basically two ways of talking about the same thing differently okay but yeah i don't see any distance between what i think and what slavoj thinks on this on this on this question at all okay well what about um reconciliation with contradiction because in the paper i mentioned zizek um he sort of like he sort of implies that the way you understand the reconciliation with contradiction as deepening into further um more difficult contradictions he sort of implies that this is like a almost like an infinite spiral downwards right. and for and then he mentions how for him it's actually the movement from external antagonism to inner self contradiction so i mean from reading i've read emancipation after hegel and to me you clearly make at multiple multiple points you mention how when you posit the enemy you're ignoring your own internal contradiction so i think you have space for whatever zizek's talking about in terms of the movement from external antagonism antagonism to inner self-contradiction but is there any difference you think in the way any emphasis that zizek would put on that you wouldn't or in terms of understanding reconciliation with contradiction yeah so the the german term is Verzonung, and i think that that for me that's really the key term. And I mean, Alf Habung, obviously, everyone knows that's the key term. But Verzunung or reconciliation with with contradiction is for me the key term. And and I think you're right. And I that's how that's how I was going to answer the question in, in the way that you already anticipated. That I think what I of course I don't disagree with what Slavoj says about how obviously they're you're making a move from an external opposition or antagonism to an internal contradiction. I guess all I would say to that is not all internal contradictions are the same, right? That there's, that there's, I don't think it's an infinite spiral downward. It's interesting that on the one hand, Slavoj is critical of me for having this, you know, permanent revolution idea of being reconciled with contradiction. And then on the other hand, he thinks, well, I'm too sanguine about the notion of an end of history. So 
I think you you kind of can't have it both ways that 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 no, I don't believe in a permanent revolution on down, down, down. I think there is an end point for Hegel. Okay. But I think that the 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 movement is I have a very I think it's a precise way of articulating this, that it's a it's an ever more intractable contradiction that mm-hmm. that thought seeks out. And so yeah, that involves this movement from the external to the internal, but not just that. Obviously, there are, right. are varying degrees of internal contradiction, and so that's. I, I I don't see I don't see what his objection was as a, as a, as that it's a kind of dif- distinction without so much of a difference for me. Except that I don't think that's the only move, right? Like I think there's also yeah. these different kinds of external contradictions, even and mm-hmm. but but for sure, the idea of I just wrote a, a little essay on Hegel and it's called something like how Hegel doesn't understand Hegel's position on war. And it's because he thinks war is necessary. And my claim would be, well, from a Hegelian perspective, any war is always going to be misleading because it's going to it's going to turn what is an internal contradiction into an external opposition. So mm. I so I think that that. I obviously I agree with that point that Slavoj is making. I just would say, I, I mean, the point I was making in the book is just more, it's it's just a lot, I think it's more nuanced than than mm-hmm. just that. Yeah, I was actually I was thinking that you would respond in that way, but so I was trying to sort of figure out how I would try and maybe think in terms of what Zizek would say back, yeah. and I think what Zizek would say is that for him, um. Like you mentioned how for you, there is an end in some way. You think Hegel can think an end. So I would ask you, what what exactly is that end? And also for Zizek, I think the absolute for him is that, re- he, he says it pretty explicitly in Less Than Nothing, it is the reconciliation with your own incompleteness. Like in the context of subjectivity, it's accepting the transcendental horizon. And this is sort of the condition of reaching an absolute and touching the real. So I think what Zizek would say is he would put more emphasis on the move to internal self-contradiction because this is the way you come to the absolute, because the absolute for him is reconciliation with that internal self-contradiction where you realize, um, to use your terminology, it's intractable. So I think he would say that all these external antagonisms, they're fundamentally not, they're, they're not directed towards let's say the absolute or towards absolute knowing because absolute knowing is always the subject's own reconciliation with its own lack impossibility negativity however you want to put it so so what would you say to that yeah i think that no i i i I agree with that like i think that that's right that 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 reconciliation with contradiction is reconciliation with one's own internal split right i i do think it's interesting and i don't know what he would say to this that he goes back and forth between the notion of incompletion mm-hmm. and contradiction, right? And I think an incompletion allows him to assimilate Hegel, I think, a little bit easier to quantum physics, right? Like it, it does put it yeah. Hegel more. And and I'm all for that assimilation. But I'm not sure that just in terms of logic, that Hegel's I think Hegel's trying to deduce uh contradiction like the the intractability of contradiction and that's what i would that's for me what the point of the absolute is right where Mm -hmm. i can't get i i realize that no matter where what step i take i'm not going to escape i'm not this position is never going to escape contradiction is that the same thing as incompletion i don't know what hegel would say to that i think slavoy would want to say that they're the same it's as it's it's interestingly related to the way in which he'll slip back and forth between the term antagonism and the term contradiction. And again, I think he would want to say they're the same, but I, I'm i not sure that he's, I think he's taken over the term antagonism from uh, Ernesto Laclau and Chantel Mouffe in their book, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, which, so that's written in 1988 or something, or 87, just right before Slavoj wrote Sublime Object. And he was, linked to them in and and the, eventually there was a fairly violent break with with Laclau and I'm totally on Slavoj's side but in, in so much so that I think I'm on his side more than he is because <laughs> I think his his use of the term antagonism I wonder if it isn't a, a 
remainder of that relationship to La Clau and Roof mm. and this and their notion that of radical democracy, which he's he endorsed in Sublime Object, and then he gradually over the 90s, I think by 2000, he was like, I'm I'm not democracy is a fetish to cover over capital. Uh, I think he says that somewhere, uh, or at least he that's his position. Um, so I don't know. So I think that that those are two terms incompletion. I, th I think he would feel I think incompletion makes a little more sense to me in line with mm. contradiction. But I, I, I think antagonism suffers from that is this external relation and whereas contradiction is clearly internal. And so I, 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 I worry a little bit about the use of the slipping back and forth between contradiction and antagonism. Right. Yeah. Um, so would you say then this is now my Terry Pinker debate uh, inspired question, because so um, in less than nothing, Zizek is uh, I mean, he, he spends a lot of time trying to explain how um, something like negativity has to be present in nature. Right. Or like and that's what he was doing with the quantum mechanics thing. And then so he's asked in the debate whether he thinks negativity exists in nature or comes before the subject. And he just says, oh, I don't know. So one of his biggest um, issues, he doesn't know. And that's fair enough. So I would ask you the same question. Do you think that you can think negativity or contradiction in nature, like before the subject? And would um, putting emphasis more on contradiction than something like antagonism or incompletion um, be um, perhaps lead you to a different conclusion than Zizek would? come to yeah i think he knows i i think he was trying to be he does this all the time right like he's try, i think he was just trying to be agree i mean i i do it too everybody does it you're trying yeah. to be agreeable you're not trying to you don't want to have a a harsh thing uh you know graham Harmon did it to me when we had a yeah. debate on this yeah. very channel i think so uh i mean he really wanted to say oh can't you see <laughs> you're so idiotic don't you <laughs> uh okay but i think <laughs> the problem is if he listened to this he'll say he's just projecting like that was what he was thinking of me but uh i think he does think that because and i think contradiction is the vehicle for thinking this because the i think to me hegel's point is it, that nature has to be contradictory in order to give birth to a contradictory being like the subject right mm -hmm. so to me that's i th i think hegel's very very clear about that 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 uh that we have to we have to presuppose a contradictory nature because of the status of subjectivity and so that's how we actually do know something about the what comes before us uh un we don't have to rely on like canton mayasus his like we carbon dating we know there were things yeah, before no yeah. no we know we know that nature was contradictory before us because we're speaking beings and i think it's even I would even say, for I mean, Hegel didn't. Hegel w was notoriously unimpressed by the natural world. Like he's just like he's like whatever. Like Kant, there's a real split between Kant and Hegel on this. Like so, Kant thought artistic beauty was the model for. Sorry, that was a funny slip. That natural beauty is a model mm -hmm. for artistic beauty, mm -hmm. right? Hegel thought the other way around. He thought artistic beauty is actually the model for natural beauty, which is why he would go hiking in the Alps. He'd be like, eh, it's not, it's no big deal. <laughs> like, right. He just, he just, yeah. he was unimpressed. Although my, my friend, Adrian Johnson did tell me he's researched this quite a bit. He's like, but Hegel was impressed with like rushing water block, you know, mm. like destroying something. So like, so there was a sense of like, this wild destructiveness of the nature mm -hmm. and its ability to like break things apart, he was impressed by. And why would he be? Because that's this contradiction of the natural world. So even the thing that seems most solid is broken, can can break in two. And that's and for Hegel, I mean, Hegel's example is the apple, right? That the we know that the apple is contradictory because we can take a bite out of it. Mm -hmm. Now that seems on one level, that just seems stupid, right? Like, what is it like my eating the apple or you drinking that water doesn't say anything about it because we're doing it to that thing. But Hegel's point is it has to be able to be done to where it can't, mm. something can't be done to it. And I, I right. find that incredibly convincing. And I think it's something that we never think about. Like, we just think about the person or thing doing the action. We never think, well, something must be 
vulnerable to that being able to happen to them mm -hmm. or to it for that to for that to take place. And I think Hegel thinks in those kinds of ways, which is why I think he thinks we can talk about nature prior to and outside of human interaction with it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what Zizek himself says in the preface to The Sublime Object, the one written in 2009, I think, or 2007. He says that the move from understanding to reason like, is pretty much exactly what you, says. He, you say. He just uses the term negativity and not contradiction. Yeah. So for Zizek, it's um, the understanding divides. Reason recognizes the inherent power of negativity in reality itself. So that was Zizek's position 15 15 years ago so um if, if he's saying now as you're saying i think he was just trying to be agreeable yeah. with yeah i think that's fine and it's totally understandable yeah. yeah and i think like 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 terry pinker i don't know him but he was like he he had a very i thought an interesting non-hegelian conception of nature right he's like mm -hmm. nature just has like little holes in it it's little it's like it's spark it's like it's got it's it's not consistent and i i thought well that's not that doesn't see that may be true, but it doesn't seem. I didn't see a Hegelian justification for that position. So, I mean, anyway, but right. I think you're, I think, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's just, it's one of the, uh, I don't know, ways debates go, right? That, yeah, that, that you exactly. Don't, you don't, you don't say everything. Yeah. That's why it's better to have just one person on and then they can, there's no one to respond back. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. right, right. So, um, actually, so I've been wondering, actually, since I, I read the phenomenology of spirit, most of it now, and I was so in it, Hegel called. So first of all, you define reason as the power of recognizing contradiction right. and uh, the understanding simply divides um, and reason rec uh, notices the identity of identity of difference. Right. Um, and so but Hegel in the phenomenology of spirit. He says that reason is the shape of consciousness which knows itself as all reality. So just to quote him, he says, reason is the certainty of consciousness that it, it is all reality. Thus does idealism express its notion. Um, and then he says, it is for self-consciousness an object. So it itself is the object such that any other object, whatever, is a non-being. So this is almost sort of like a like a Fichtean idealism, like an idealism where there is no noumenal reality. Everything is non-being. Uh, everything outside of it. So how would you relate that? I mean, it, just at face value, it's very the traditional idealist um, idea of, so how would you relate Hegel saying that reason recognizes itself as all reality? How would you relate that to you saying that reason is the power of re recognizing contradiction? Right. Because, so I think it's a, it's a great question. And I think the answer is is really to me, interesting i mean i don't think my point is interesting i think hegel's idea is interesting so mm -hmm. i think his idea is that it's only when you think the totality as reason does that you actually grasp the contradiction because otherwise and this has to do with like the way like you you think about the other is completely separate from you right like if i think i let's say i have an enemy right god forbid i have an enemy in my department let's say and I just think like that enemy embodies all the things that I just hate in the world, right? Like they're, they're parsimonious. They, they, they care about status. They, all these things that I hate. Yeah. And then I just, I just hate them. They're just totally other to me. Right. And I just think that that has nothing to do with me. But of course, if I'm a, this is more psychoanalytic point than Hegel because I'm choosing a psychic example, but I think the point holds, uh, I would just say like, all these things that I think are bad in this person, like clearly they like they're there they must be part of my own self or I wouldn't they wouldn't so irritate me right in this enemy. Right. Right. So that's Hegel's point about reason. Like if you don't th if you allow yourself, which reason doesn't like if you're un thinking in terms of understanding or what Hegel will sometimes call ordinary thinking, if you're thinking in ordinary terms or terms of understanding you allow something to be external. And so then mm. you avoid the contradiction because it's just an opposition. It's just like, that's, I'm here, that's out there. There's no contradiction. Mm -hmm. But if you think the totality, everything you th you relate, every other position has to be part of you in relation to you. Mm. And so then you're like, well, wait a minute. All these things I thought were just in my enemy are actually 
unconsciously part of myself too. Mm -hmm. So that's, and then I have to recognize that I'm a contradictory being. I, I, on the one hand, despise status, but unconsciously I must really want it. Right. So right, right. that, that's the point, right. That you, that, that you, this is again, why I think Hegel's so close to psychoanalysis just for this thing, but reason for reason grasps contradiction because it doesn't allow anything to remain outside. Like once you mm. think in terms of the totality, then nothing's outside, then contradiction becomes evident. Mm. And if, as long as you allow yourself an outside, you're never going to have to confront contradiction because you're, that's going to be other. That's right. going to be, there's no identity of identity and difference. Hegel's famous formulation of identity. Uh, instead, there's just this, this thing that's different. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what about this example? Because you mentioned how when you're being irritated by someone, you're just like, oh, they're just, you know, they're irritating to me and out there, they that's the source of the irritation. Yeah. But I think the Hegelian point is that, well, it's the subject that makes things count for it. Right. So right. E evil is in evil doesn't have like, I mean, it's sort of a Christian idea. It doesn't have objective substance. It is precisely the subject that makes that count. So uh, would you like, would an example of sort of reason be instead of just being irritated, irritated by people out there, you recognize fundamentally that whatever irritation you have is fundamentally your own. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not bad people. And that's sort of the contradiction there. You can still have an enemy. I think Zizek stresses this. You can still have the enemy, but nonetheless not fall into the logic of the enemy, like sort of an understanding logic. You can still be reasonable and posit an enemy. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I just would, I, I like to just not use those terms just to, I, I use a terminological distinction just to make it clear, mm -hmm. but maybe, I mean, what you said, I totally agree with, but I just, I, what I say is for, for Hegel, we can't have enemies, but we can have adversaries, right? right. So we still have adversaries. We have to defeat. Mm -hmm. We can't have enemies that activate us, yep. that get us into this friend enemy Schmidt and Carl Schmidt mm -hmm. uh, distinction, you know, that, so I think I, but whatever, I mean, your point is you, you just said it in the same way, said the same thing differently, but yeah, but I, I think that's absolutely right. That, that, and it, it's how it gets activated in the subject. That's what, like you give the, you give credence to that thing and then that you make it count as you said. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. So last point on the, on reason Um. I was, so when I read this phrase, reason uh, knows itself as all reality. So I was, I was wondering if, what do you think about this interpretation? I'm not sure how much it fits with your own, but I was thinking, what if Hegel is trying to say that, not that in the sense of all reality, in the sense of uh, the devouring monster that brings everything into the notion, but rather it is all reality in the sense that it knows itself as all real, as all true. So they're like in, in unhappy consciousness, for example, there is the sense that it sees itself as something untrue within it in a way that it's not fully and and then in reason there it recognizes itself as all reality and that subject in a sense is substance and substance is subject so what would you think of that real of that reading not not as reason recognizing um that it is all reality but that it is all reality that it is all true yeah very good very good and i think the the distinction that Hegel will work through is the way in which subject moves from certainty to truth, right? Like that's the trajectory mm -hmm. of like the, the, the phenomenology is playing out that opposition between certainty and truth, certainty and mm -hmm. truth. And then I think you're right. Like once we get to reason in a certain way, certainty of truth have come together here for the first time. So the subject has acceded to the truth of its being. I think that's right. And then Really, what happens later is that the subject has to, in, in some way, be dethroned by seeing the way in which spirit trumps right. its own. Like reason is is really the high point of individual subjectivity one mm -hmm. might say, in the mm -hmm. phenomenology. And then spirit comes along. It's almost like the book starts to be rewritten once we get to the spirit section from the perspective of of the, the collective. And I yes. think that that's, you know, I think it's Hegel's real anti-liberalism that anti-liberal in the best sense right mm -hmm. like I, I mean it's a political liberal to some extent but but against this liberal philosophy that says the individual can be the starting point for our thinking or experiencing he doesn't think that and that's what turns with spirit but i think you're right when we get to reason then certainty has become truth so there's mm -hmm. no longer a truth 
there's no longer truth is out there then i i truth i what was out there is now in here so yeah. i think that's that's a good that's a really nice way to think of it okay um so uh, we are talking about Zizek. So um, I was wondering what you thought about Zizek's understanding of reason. I think we've already sort of touched on that. You agree that it's recognizing the inherent par power of negativity or contradiction in reality. But I was wondering what you think about um, uh, Zizek's idea of the emptying of the subject. So in the preface to the sublime object, he calls it Hegelian shitting. So um, it so. To, to quote him, he says, in this strict sense, the subject itself is the abrogated slash cleansed substance, a substance reduced to the void of empty form of self-relating negativity, emptied of all wealth of personality. So to me, um, I have the suspicion, and you can correct me on this, that when Zizek makes this move and sort of identifies the absolute with letting nature go, and then the subject remains as the abrogated cleansed subject, I think he's almost remaining at the understanding. And I say this because the, here's a quote from Hegel, and I know I'm just throwing quotes at you, so don't okay. feel pressure to you know okay. uh, have an amazing response, but I'm sure it will be. But he says, actual reason, however, this is Hegel, actual reason, however, is not so inconsistent as that on the contrary, being at first only the certainty that it is all reality, it is, it is aware in this notion that qua certainty, qua I, it is not yet in truth reality, and it is impelled to raise its certainty to truth and to give filling to the empty mind. So Hegel says that the move from understanding to reason is you have the cleanse subject, the pure night of the understanding, I equals I, that pure negativity, but then reason is you're giving filling to the empty mind. Mind. I think this is basically the opposite of what Zizek says, because Zizek says that reason is um, part of reason or part of spirit and absolute spirit is letting nature go and the subject remaining precisely as the empty mind. So am I misunderstanding something here, or do you think Zizek departs, sort of departs from Hegel at the understanding? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I know he's very fond of this metaphor of 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 the evacuation, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because it comes from a medieval Christianity and this idea of kenosis, and right, yep. and I think that's very important for the reading of Hegel, but. I think Hegel's idea, and I think this is consistent with what you read, the quotation you read from him, is that it's it's God's, it's not subjectivity's emptying out. It's actually like history is God's emptying out, right? And I think mm -hmm. that that's, I think you're right to no, to pick up on that. I think that's slightly different. And I do think, I wonder if, I understand why. I mean, there's other reasons why Slavoj likes this idea of the emptied out subject because he he it coincides with Lacan's notion of yeah. subject as void, right? And so I think mm -hmm. that that's important to him. But I do think that there's a risk, and I think I've become more and more convinced that Lacan is actually a Kantian and and not a Hegelian, and that Slavoj has incredibly read him as a Hegelian. But I yeah. think that actually. No, he's he's deep mm -hmm. down a Conti. And there's these Hegelian moments that come through, like starting in seminar nine, maybe, and then for a little bit, and then it disappears. Uh, and then the ultimate Kantian moment would be the formulas of sexuation, I think, as Joan Kopchak shows really nicely. So I th I wonder if that's the if this clinging to the void of subjectivity and the voided subject, you know, emptied out subjectivity isn't this attempt to preserve this connection between Lacan and Hegel. And I think yeah. you're, I, the, the, the line from Hegel, I think is right. That, um, that, that reason is giving a content to subjectivity that it didn't have prior. And I, I would also say this, that I think that uh, for the, in certain way, the opposition between Kant and Hegel is the opposition between an empty formal subject Transcendental and a, and perception, a subject with a yeah. content, right? Yeah. Like that's the the even the Kantian Kantian morality, not just the Kantian theoretical philosophy, but the Kantian morality has to be formalist and empty, and that's the nature of Hegel's critique of Kantian morality. It's interesting because I'll never remember where now, but Slavoj at some point, maybe tearing with the negative or something, says Hegel critiques Kant for having a purely formal morality, but he doesn't see that that's the whole point. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, yeah. interesting. Like, 
there's a so i do think i mean this is a standard thing like slavoy accuses badu of being a secret conti and there's this yeah. there's this like everyone's a secret conti and so i don't want to <laughs> say that but i i wonder if this is if this notion of the evacuated subject isn't a Kantian Lacanian yeah. uh, holdover. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I I I could be wrong about that, but I I'd be interested to hear how he would respond to that. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I think he would say I I don't know. I mean, I don't think he would accept that as a criticism. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I would be very interested to hear him too. And I think I definitely have that suspicion as well. And the reason is, as you mentioned in the phenomenology, the second part is sort of you move out of the individual into the spiritual community. I don't know how you get from the bard or the emptied subject to the spiritual community. I can see um, maybe even you've said something similar to this, where it's united. The spiritual community is united in its very lack. In, yeah. in its very um, lack of self-identity. And I think, I mean, I think this is probably Hege a Hegelian move, like what Hegel himself thought in a way. But um, at the same time, I don't know, like, would you know how to get from the emptied subject to the spiritual community? Like, what would be the move precisely that gets you out of the understanding and into the realm of well, first of all, content like reason and then to the spiritual substance. Well, I don't think you such. can get from understanding. I mean, that's the whole point that understanding is a barrier to spirit, right? To mm. Geist. Like you have, that's why Hegel thinks you have to have this point of reason before you can cognize yeah. Geist yes. or spirit, right? So I think that that's, even though reason is still limited in the, to that it takes the individual subject as the point of departure, it nonetheless, it, 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 it doesn't, it, 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 it recognizes, I mean, the, the, what's, what, what may, what is the bridge is that as long as you're stuck in the understanding, you're stuck in opposition. And so you cannot relate to the other through this idea of shared lack. Right. And mm -hmm. that's the, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the bond between uh, subjects in right. Geist. Yeah. Right. So that idea of the shared lack, I think it's, um, I don't think it's explicit in Hegel. You could, if I'm wrong there. Oh, right. I mean, I, 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 maybe it's not, but I think there's a, there's enough sections where, I mean, look, clearly he doesn't think that the, the people themselves are cognizant of it, but I think he thinks that they are, uh, like the, the, the idea of a spiritual community or of uh, when he's talking in the religion section of Holy spirit, like, I think he really thinks that there's this idea of we're divided between the beyond and, and mm. us mm -hmm. together. And that in that we are together through uh, the death of Christ, right? Like through mm -hmm. the, through the death of the, of the beyond, mm -hmm. that's what holds us together. So I think that there, I mean, I think what he would say is, and this is a nice psychoanalytic point that you're not bonded. I, th I just think this is true. And I think he, he doesn't put it in exactly this way, but I think it's definitely there that we're not bonded through our own lack, but through our shared conception of the other being lacking, right? Like that through, because like we have all, uh, we we're all at the base of the cross, right? We've all, we've all accepted the death of, the death of the God of the beyond and that, and that the, the fact that we don't, we, we share a lacking authority. That's the bond of that's, that's the spiritual bond. So I think he does kind of okay. say that. I mean, you know, again, it's not in the terms that we would use, but I think, I think he does say it. Right. And so I think that's similar to what, um, Zizek was right at the beginning of that paper where you say that Hegel is misleading in the terms he used when he uses the term like absolute good or the spirit striving towards the good. So um, would you say that G Hegel really did miss the reality of what we could say, the drive, or we could say like like explicitly the spiritual community is bonded in its lack in the sense that I think this is based on the psychoanalytical idea that um satisfaction is in failure and it's in pursuing the object not in getting so it's not in in um attaining the good it's in pursuing the good in a ultimately in a way that will fail and that's the logic of desire so do you think that they're tr like i i think zizek well we'll get into what zizek responds to 
after you respond, but like, how would you, how would you understand Hegel's relation to something like the drive or pursuing uh, satisfaction in failure? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. Like, I think he really, uh, my basic point, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to address your next question because okay. I think I, I just thought, I didn't think Slavoj got exactly what I was saying. All I was saying was, don't use the term good, right? Like, <laughs> like as long as you're using the term good as the thing that's orienting our struggle, mm -hmm. then you've you've missed what the, you've missed the point. Because I think, and 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 I think that's just a naive point on Hegel's part. So it wasn't a critique of anything necessarily Hegel was saying, except that that one idea that mm. the idea that we're drawn to the good in any way in any way, like you, what you said is exactly right, that the psychoanalytic point, which I think is is exactly correct, is that we're drawn to the failure, to the to failure to reach the good. We're, we're all the time sabotaging the good, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, that's why, that's why capitalism is the most successful, it's the ruling system today. It's successful in its failure, but yeah. okay. But why? Because it is the first system, I think, in the history of the world to not put the good at the center, right? Like it's, mm. it puts an ec a stupid excess at the center, right? And it says, don't do what's like, like, like any other system right now, we'd be like, wait a minute, we're not going to all survive if we don't take drastic action for our own good to save the planet. But we're in a system where no one's even, I mean, like there's a couple people, Greta Thunberg, there's a few people, but most of the people are like, eh, I just want the cheap gas or I want to fly in my private jet. I was just reading a nice thing and I think it was in the Times or Guardian and about not the how much the private jet, uh, uh, you know, how, yeah, how, how yeah. much that's destroying the environment. So, and and the, what's great about it is, and it's like the elite need to pay their fair, but what what I love is that if someone said we need to ban private jets, it's not the elite that would be the raise the outcry. It's the people that would raise the outcry because they'd be like, wait a minute, I would have still imagined elites flying around in their private yeah. jets and and really enjoying themselves and like having orgies up there or whatever. So so but but that's because it's a system not organized around the good. So I just think that that's a total mm -hmm. and like fine. Hegel lived before Freud, he lived before the full flowering of capital he didn't see it but i just think if you have the good as the reference point you've missed something and i right. think that, that that he does that so that's and and i think slavoy kind of didn't get that that's all i was saying right Ye yeah well so well here's what zizek here's what he says because i don't think he actually really addresses the point you were making and it's it's not like you're making a deep critique as you were saying it's just really the term terminological it's just stuff. terminological right, right. And, and here's what he, here's what he says he says what gets lost here is the key that there is no self-identical subject which plays with itself in divisions division comes first it precedes what is divided and the self-identity which emerges in the course of this process is a form of self-division so for and then he'll go on to say that in a sense um, if we want to use the term good, the subject is always already reconciled with itself. It's already attained the good. But I think for Zizek, the twist, and I don't know if Hegel makes it. So I think the twist is that it's already reconciled with itself in the mode of a failure. And the perfect um, the perfect formula for this is in less than nothing, where Zizek is um, trying to explain object A as the whole in reality, as the counter object of the subject and he says the subject tries to represent itself it fails the subject is the result of this very failure so i think that has to do with self division proceeding so but do you even do you disagree with that i, I, don't, I don't object know. to that at all i think it's great yeah okay. it's great so great. do you I, do you I, think hegel thinks that do you think hegel uh, can think this yeah i think hegel thinks that but again I, my only point was this small little point about terminology. So I, <laughs> yeah. you know, it just it kind of, it was, I, I was a little sad that he took that as a point because I, I, I his objection, I agreed with. So there was right. nothing really to, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So um, now we're going to, okay, let's move on just to deal with the stuff on history, because okay. that's actually the main point of that, that it article. Right. Um, so I think, Okay, so Zizek says, um, well, first of all, here's a very simple question. Why, if 
if when we overcome contradiction, we just meet a more intractable uh, contradiction. Why is that a um, why is that a call to act, as you say? Why why not just remain within capitalism and just deal with our shitty situation here, try to make the best out of it? Why why would we even go to communism if that we just meet a more difficult contradiction? Well, because I mean the whole the whole point of Hegel's thought is that's what drives us, right? Yeah. Like that's what that's where we find that that that's where we find our satisfaction. And again, like this shows, I think, how proximity is to psychoanalysis because that's a cert, there's a kind of conception of the drive just in just the way you described it in that. But he doesn't he doesn't quite get that. But that all I would just say is that's how we find our sat that's what's satisfying is right. the, is precisely that move onward. So to say like, oh, let's just reckon no, I mean that of course that's not the point. And and one of the things that that I would say to this, and I, I I think this is not clear in the book. So I think this is I'm glad that Slavoj objected to this point that of course it can't be reconciling ourselves to just the shitty conditions of capitalism because capitalism itself is the failure to reconcile itself to contradiction. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. capitalism says there is no, I mean, this is why I think there's someone like Ayn Rand. It's not a coincidence, I don't think. I think she's the great capitalist thinker. I mean, I know she's whatever people don't think she's a great thinker, but I think she's the great thinker of capitalism. And I, you know, one of the, one of the subsections of Atlas Shrugged said it's just titled A equals A, right? And so <laughs> I think it's amazing because, you know, that, that idea to me, that is absolutely essential to the capitalist project that A equals A. And if you reject that A equals A, that you're on the path to socialism or communism or what i don't have the same thing about the words as slavoj does like he thinks once you say socialism you're lost forever and you know, <laughs> i don't i don't care about that probably it's because i'm in america and if you said both you know you you're 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 on trial for witchery whichever one you say uh but i i just think like that 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 the capitalism itself cannot accept contradiction and the system is structured around the refusal of contradiction so there's no way to be reconciled to contradiction within capitalist mm. society so that's just point at the end of the line okay. uh okay so there's that and then then i think so that's why it's not this that's not why it's not just accept this quietus just accept what is mm -hmm. right and then i think like like is there there but there has to be an end point and the end point is for hegel I mean, I think I can see why Slavoj would say it's communism. Okay, whatever. but but it's a but I think for Hegel, it's it's more of a philosophical. Like when he says the end of history, what he means is, I've, I've, I think he means this really. It sounds egotistical, but I think he mean really means like someone, some fool was able to come along and see we're never going to escape contradiction. Yeah. That's me, and so history ends because. Mm. There's, and I think he's just right about this. There's never going to be another insight. That that insight is never going to be taught, mm. like, no matter what happens. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna, like Elon Musk is not going to invent something that overcomes contradiction, right? Like there's a car, it goes so fast, and there's no more contradiction. <laughs> no, yeah. or we'll get to a planet where there there's aliens that visit us that have never experienced contradiction. Never gonna. That's not going to happen. We look out in the telescope. We're like, oh wait a minute, in that nebula. There's no con, no, right? Like that, nothing. So that's why I think Hegel was exactly right. And I think that that ends a certain kind of probing. And yeah. it, it inaugurates another kind of probing, like to find out how we best, what kind of political, social arrangement is best geared to right. that reality. But we no longer have to seek out this, like, what it, can we overcome contrary? No, that's that, mm -hmm. that that chapter of history is over. And I think he right. really thinks that. And I really think that and I, I'm not sure that Slavoj thinks that like it, it's interesting yeah. because you brought this up in your, you did a little video. I'll, I'll pimp for you a little bit, <laughs> uh, you did a little video on this. And, and you said, and, and I think you're right. I wonder if he didn't change his mind because before he said, we're always this, this claim. And I, I used to think this, so I don't think it's, I think, and, and I, I, I want to, 
I think it's a perfectly legitimate way to read Hegel, that we're always at the end of history. Mm -hmm. And that Hegel's point mm -hmm. is just, we always look backwards. We're always, so the present moment, whatever it is, is always end of history. He used to think that now he has come to this point that communism is the end of history. So mm -hmm. I think he's slightly changed his, his view, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe he still kept the other view. But anyway, I, I, I just want to say one other thing. I think philosophy of history, basically, no, I even say this in the book, I think, I don't think anyone should read it. Like, I think it's, I, you know, it, it, Hegel didn't publish it, you know, and he, yeah. and it, you know, and it's, it's, it's the most misleading text, I think, with you, unless you have, and his students would have had this, the gloss of all his other works behind it, you know, and, and so I just think it's also, you know, he didn't publish it and, and, and it's transmitted by students. I don't yeah. know, you know, you know, it's be like... <laughs> Would 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 I always think this about the enemies of Hegel who often take this as their prime text, right? Like the champions of Hegel never talk about it. The enemies always take it as their prime text, like Karl Popper loves this text. I always think, well, would you like your student like your student's <laughs> representation of your class to be your thought? Yeah. No, no one would want that. So I just think like, like maybe we should just not pay so much attention to this. Right. Text. Right. Okay, well, yeah, so like, um, so you mentioned how uh, that moment when we recognize that every identity is contradictory. This is the big moment, right? This is the end of history, and this is modernity, right? So when G when Zizek says, um, he's like, well, why isn't modernity just one moment within the triad of Christianity, modernity, um, uh, and communism? So, um, and I think you gave the answer, like your answer. And here's here's what I was wondering. I, Zizek doesn't say this. But this, to me, I think is sort of implied in what he's saying. I think he, what, and this is what he was saying when he was big on the Christian atheism stuff. I think what he would say is that Christianity is that big moment. Christ on the cross is the big moment. And it's not that Christianity needs to be overcome and that we come to a more, um, a more universal recognition of contradiction in modernity. It's that that overcoming has already happened like as he says the absolute is already here the reconciliation has already happened so in christianity itself that recognition the recognition of universal freedom it's already occurred so what needs to happen isn't an overcoming of re christianity or even a reconciliation with it but um an imminent movement of the notion of christianity itself of god is dead so what would you think of this idea where it's not that we need to move to these different stages of history and overcome them in a way i don't i don't know if you would use that that terminology but it's it's more so that Chris, the christian event needs to become for itself and the beginning of that for itself is when christ dies on the cross so as we know from lacan god always already was dead he just didn't know it but it's mm -hmm. when christ dies on the cross that he knows it and then all of the history of emancipation it's just that movement of of the death of god becoming for itself so in that way modernity isn't the big event modernity is just one may, maybe a very important event in the christian truth in its imminent unfolding throughout history so what would you what would you think of that yeah i think that's right i think that i but again like i just think that the terrain of the debate shifts slightly right like mm. like my point about the philosophy of history was just about the recognition that hegel is able to make and that i think holds outside of this actual historical events that are going on but i think that i think you're right about this like modernity is just in some way the becoming for itself of the christian event right like that 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 really and and then maybe something like communism is the the end point of that mm. i don't know but i do think that there there's a little it's interesting because i think slavoj is often rightly reluctant to talk about hegel and predicting the future right and yeah. so it's just interesting to me that this is a point where it, it's almost i i don't mean this because it's 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 too it's too it's too mean but it's a, he's a little too close to brandom right and this notion that like we're, we're we can see where we're headed like for brandom it's it's a, a world of mutual recognition of course it's not that for slavoy but yeah. it is communism and so i mean i i guess he what he would say is that communism is just the the for itself 
of the death of God, right? So, yeah. and that makes sense to me. I mean, I just, I, all I would say is I don't think, uh, based on the recognition that contradiction is inescapable, right? I don't think it's clear to Hegel, at least, or to me, what kind of political structure that would imply. Like so, com right, I right. think communism is already too concrete. Even though I, I think Slavoj would say, well, I don't it, what it's open what that means, but I think it's already maybe too concrete. Okay, so so what would you say to Gigi? So Gigi spends he spends a lot of time on something that I don't know if you disagree with, um, and that's the, the this idea of predestination. So you're talking about how we can know the future and stuff, and and Gigi says he basically says that we are predestined, we're thrown in whatever deterministic universe, but the power of spirit is to be able to look back upon its past, reinterpret its past, and make space for a new necessity, a new necessary future. So do you do you agree with that? I agree with that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Like, I think <laughs> okay. that is the entire key to Hegel's, what do you want to call it? Like theoretical politics, mm -hmm. right? So so Slavoj loves this line from, you know, the Al of Minerva takes flight only with the falling of dusk from preface to philosophy of right. And that seems to suggest that Hegel's just a political quietist, right? There's mm -hmm. nothing we can do. Philosophy comes too late, blah, 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 blah. But it's interesting. So, to, so 1808, something like this, after publication of Phenomenology, he writes a letter to his friend, uh, Emmanuel Niedheimer, and he says, I've I've come to think more and more that once we change the world in theory, the world of practice can't hold out for very much, very long. So you're like, wait a minute. And and so Lukacs, Georg Lukacs is like, well, here we see the difference between the early Hegel and the late Hegel, except there's not one point in which in Hegel's thought you can say this is an early idea and this is a late idea. Once he Basically, after 18 or even before, like 1798, 1799, if he thinks a thing, he thinks that from the from that right. time forward. Right. Right. So why would there be this thing, which seems hugely important, where he has this one idea that seems like, oh, philosophy can just basically totally shape the world. And then 12 years later, 13 years later, he's he's totally backtracks on that. So mm -hmm. I think exactly what Slavoj was saying is what he means by that statement. That is that theory can rewrite the past and thus change the necessity heading to the future. Yeah. So that's why there's a kind of like almost like it can't give us any political. It can't say like, I don't know, I go on different YouTube things and podcasts and people are always like, OK, OK, but tell us what to do. And I'm like, sorry, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Right. I always say the same thing. I don't know. Whatever. You know better than me. Uh, but. And I think Hegel would say the same thing, but to re to the theoretical task is instead to rewrite the past, not to set up new plans for mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, and I, I think what's fascinating about our historical time is that the right wing is great at this yeah. and the left wing basically sucks. Hmm. So I think it's a, I think that, that, that we really should take his advice and Slavoj makes this point in this critique of me. And I can't tell you how much I agree with that. Like, I think okay. that is absolutely correct. And I think what's interesting to me, I, Slavoj and I disagree about him. We like, he likes one film from him, Prestige, but basically he hates Christopher Nolan. Uh, he thinks he's a, you know, a liberal compromise. I mean, right, some of the films rightfully so, like the Batman things. Uh, but I think what's interesting is in Tenet, Nolan basically conceives of political action in yeah. just moving backwards, mm -hmm. right? In a very Hegelian way. And so I I really like that. You know, I don't think the film necessarily, I think theoretically the film is very confused because it's basically an attack on people that are trying to do something about the global environmental catastrophe. So, hmm. okay. So it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's like his anti-French revolution, Dark Knight Rises, right? Yeah. Um, so- so that's confused, but I think, in, but I think there's this amazing conception of how political action actually has to go to the past, not to the future. So, right. or at the same time or something. But I, I think that's that that's the idea that Slavoj. I love that idea in in this critique of me, and I think that to me, there's no question that he's right about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. And okay. Last question now. Uh, absolute knowing. 
would you say that well for f the phenomenology of spirit isn't it that very reinterpretation of the past that you're talking about here isn't that the whole project of the phenomenology of spirit so i'm wondering how would you interpret the final passage of the phenomenology where he talks about spirits and the organization of their realm where it they come to comprehend their organization then we of course move to science the science of logic um so how would you how would you understand this um this this idea of the absolute um as the spirits um understanding their own organization and how from that would we um get to the idea of a future at all like how is how like how is hegel not the closed system of totality where a spirit comes to know itself as spirit how is how could we make room for as you were saying this very reinterpretation this very understanding opens up the space for a new necessity or a new future well i think the, I, yeah you're exactly right about the, the phenomenology itself is this reinterpretation of the past as the story of freedom as the unfolding of freedom mm. right so which is i think absolutely crucial because you could read it another way you could read it as no it's the development of how authority is structured or whatever mm. and then and, and then then you're gonna that's a conservative that's a hobbesian reading of history right so that's huge and then i think the i just think the final misquotation from schiller is the great is the great moment you know from the from the realm, what is it? From the chalice of the realm yep. of, from, of spirits, foams forth from him his own infinite, its own from yes. from, from, from it, its own infinitude, right? And so I think that that's the key to the opening to the future is the way that we conceive uh, unendlichkeit in infinitude, right? Like um, that, 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 and and what the so the the, the Schiller poem. Uh, just includes it does, it's not its own infinity it's just infinity and there's a dash infinity and like so mm -hmm. so the notion that it's our own infinity that it's our own infinitude that opens up that that's the opening up to the future and so i think one of the things that has was in retreat from the moment hegel finished uh or died let's say was this conception of the infinitude of 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 subjectivity and mm -hmm. of spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And so, especially in the 20th century, there's just all these like homilies to finite our human finitude. And I think uh, that's the way, that's the opening to the future is this, the inf like grasping ourselves as beings of infinitude is how we, because that's what allows us to reinterpret the past in this way and then create. Yeah. So it's the, re it's precisely the reinterpretation of the past that is how we create a new future for ourselves I think. really yeah. yeah okay well that is i mean if if you have anything else you want to you know point out anything no any, that's anything? all i got Trey. <laughs> all right well you know i think we covered a lot of ground here we basically yeah. got through that whole paper and then went on to extra stuff and yeah i think the the people will appreciate this so as always uh thank you for coming on todd great thanks for having me so much all right okay